Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Come on, let's give the Lord praise tonight. Hallelujah. If you're not on fire by now, after what all we've heard, your wood is wet. <laughs> Come on, I said, give the Lord a praise. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> now, I, I, I knew this uh, along, um, but, and I heard, I heard it from the Lord, but then I also know it now because of what I know. You're going to talk about tonight for a long time. Oh, yeah. I mean it. I said, you're going to talk about tonight for a long time. Now, you got ears to hear? Say it. My ears are blessed. Now, you know what? We need to look at that. Don't, don't sit down yet. Just get your Bible. <laughs> we need to put your eyes on that. Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and let's look at the 15th verse. This people's heart is waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, they have closed. If you can close your eyes, you can open them. Amen. Amen? Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and should be converted... Anytime I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and blessed are your ears, for they hear. Yeah. Say it. My ears are blessed. Ears are blessed. My, eyes are blessed. My eyes are blessed. Shake hands of two or three people say, Your eyes and ears are blessed. We're blessed. We're blessed. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and you may be seated. Praise God. That's something really, really special the Lord has blessed us with tonight. And uh, somebody I want to introduce to you, Brother Tony, come on up, would you please? And uh, Tony Palmer, some of you may know Tony. Tony and I go way back, but he's going he's gonna to be telling you the story. I asked him to come give his testimony, and he's got a special message for us tonight. So would you welcome Tony Palmer to this platform? Bishop, thank you, sir. Bless you. Yes, sir. Amen. Do you have any idea... What a thrill it is for me to call you bless a bishop instead of boy. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, because when I first met you, man, I mean, you're just a kid. I was a boy. Yeah. Yeah, I was 21 years ago. Amen. Glory. Yeah. Thing. Boy. I grew I mean, up. Yeah. So did a lot of others of yeah. us, you know. <laughs> Amen. You stayed the same age. Did I really? That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can see why he gets ahead. You understand? <laughs> Tony, help yourself, sir. Thank you, sir. Forgive me this opportunity to spend a couple of moments introducing to you something really, really special and historic. Kenneth asked me if I would give a little bit of background to who I am, our connection, and what we're about to show you tonight. About 22 years ago, I came to faith, a radical conversion experience, 
and it changed everything about my outlook and my life. And within a year, I found myself in full-time ministry working for the church where I got saved. And I was door knocking, giving the gospel to every single family in our suburb, which was about three and a half thousand homes. It took me and my wife eight months to speak to every single person in our, in our suburb about Jesus Christ. And that was 21 years ago. And I remember, I've never told you this, Brother Kenneth, that before we used to go out in the morning to do this evangelization, door knocking, we used to watch this crazy Texan preach the gospel, and we'd, we'd never heard anything like this before. Kenneth Copeland. He used to be our encourager every morning to go out and preach the gospel. And that's how I came across the message, the word of faith by preparing myself every morning to go out and preach the gospel by watching some video VHS tapes. Do you remember those? <laughs> Back in the 1930s. And we used to get encouraged, and, uh, and it was amazing, the work that we did. That was just the beginning. Then I went into Bible school. I got trained for the ministry. And um, eventually I, got, I went into the office in South Africa to ask a friend of mine, Steve Kutsia, who was your South African director at the, at the time, for some ad building advice. And instead of getting building advice, I got a job. Gloria, good, good evening. I got a job. I was hired by KCN. And within a year, they asked me to be the director for Africa. That would have been 1998. And I promised John when he interviewed me, I told him straight, I said, John, I'll come and work for you guys, but I'm leaving, I'm going to Italy. And I'm, kind of like, I'm not telling you I'm leaving you before I'm joining you, but you've got to know I can only stay for a while. So he asked me for three years, and I said, fine, unless the Holy Ghost tells me otherwise. That was our covenant. We made that agreement. Well, it was about two and a half years later, and the Holy Ghost said otherwise. And we were sent out to Italy, where my wife is from. I've been married to Emmy now for 22 years, and it's been a lot of fun. Italian wives are incredibly fun. <laughs> I say that with a big smile. <laughs> and it was an incredible time for us because I was born again, spirit-filled, and a evangelical Pentecostal church. Like I said, I came to radical faith, both me and Emiliana, my wife, we had radical conversion experiences. We'd been raised in the word of faith. We'd worked for Kenneth and Gloria in South Africa. But the call that we got to Italy was the call from Rome. You see, while we were visiting Italy, our family, on an annual basis, and we would share our faith with our family, it was hard for us because when they would get born again, there was nowhere for them to fellowship because the evangelical churches at that time in Italy were incredibly legalistic, where women, men and women had to sit separate and women had to wear veils on their heads. And you couldn't even go to the beach because it was considered nudity. So as loving, Jesus-loving Christians, we didn't want to send our family to those kind of churches. But then sending them back to the Catholic church, which is so traditional, that was going to kill their faith. So me and my wife prayed in 1992 in my grandmother's bedroom. Nobody knew about this prayer. We said, Lord, if you want us to leave South Africa, we will leave on one condition, that we, we come to Italy, but it must be through the Catholic church. Nobody knew about that prayer. 1992. Well, in 2003, 10 years later, 11 years later, I got a call, an email actually, from Rome saying, Tony, we've seen your ministry and we'd like you to share your ministry with the Roman Catholic Charismatic Renewal. Would you be willing to come to Italy? And there was a clause. You must be self-funded. So I thought, no problem. I'm, we, as Protestants, we've been praying for the Catholic Church for years. So obviously people are going to back me and send me. <laughs> I sent out my letters for partners. I mean, I worked for Kenneth and Gloria for three years. I knew about how partners worked. And Kenneth and Gloria were the first and the only who said, yes, we'll partner with you. And it hasn't stopped since. So the Lord said, 
what have you got? So that we got a house, we got a car. So we said, that's it. We put our house and our car in the ministry. And we moved to Italy with nothing. No ministry connections, couldn't speak Italian. Some crazy evangelical who'd been called by the Roman Catholic Church to work with them. And we were self-financed except for one partner. Well, that was 10 years ago. And if you do get to know me personally, you'll find out I'm not really a good networker. I don't try to get myself into places. In fact, I prefer to sit at the back, out of the lights, so I can enjoy the service. But God orchestrated so many divine appointments like Joseph. And it excites me because I know what I haven't done to be, to be put in front of the people I found myself. And tonight is a, is a culmination of what's happened in the last 10 years. And we have a, a very special message. And I wanted you to understand the connection between KCM and the Catholic Charismatic Renewal because the Catholic Charismatic Renewal is the hope of the church, the Catholic church. I was at a meeting at St. Peter's, um, I think it was about a year and a half ago, it was Pentecost, celebrating, remembering the coming of the Holy Spirit, and uh, Pope, Pope Benedict, there was 450,000 of us outside of St. Peter's singing, come Holy Spirit. All Catholics, except a couple of us who, they call us the ecumenical delegation. <laughs> I remember the first time I actually put on the long telari, it's a, it's a long black cassock. You've seen the priest when they wear the cassocks? I had to wear mine. And I didn't, I didn't know that you had to wear trousers underneath. <laughs> so I remember, and they, they, because we were honored guests, they put us in the first row, and the Pope was right next to us. And I crossed my legs, and my leg came out. <laughs> and all the bishops looked at me. <laughs> and they said, he's Anglican, don't worry. <laughs> Funny. So I was really not trying to work the system. <laughs> Pope Benedict, he said to all the charismatic leaders, charismatic Catholics, publicly, he said this in Italian to them. He said, you charismatics, you are the hope of the church. Stop. That's only the antipasta. He said, and you need to evangelize within before you evangelize outside. And when I saw that, I realized that I'd given my life to a good cause because it wasn't just some p political diplomatic maneuvering of the Catholic Church to try and get us all to become one big thing. They really wanted their people to come to faith. Um, about eight years ago, I was working for the Catholic Church in South America, in Argentina. And it's protocol, when we go into a Catholic diocese, we go visit the Catholic bishop and we ask his permission to work among his people. And when I went to Argentina, the bishop that I had to visit at that time was uh, uh, Father Mario Jorge Bergoglio. And he and I struck up a, a very intimate relationship. I have three spiritual fathers. Um, the man who ordained me a priest, Archbishop Robert Wise, 10 years ago and then later consecrated me four years ago as a bishop. He's my spiritual father. Kenneth Copeland, without a doubt, he received me in South Africa very much, so we, we connected very quickly, you and I. And Emmy and Gloria, my wife, we had good times, those three victory campaigns in 99. And I remember the day before I was ordained a priest, I came to Brighton to visit you and ask for your permission and your blessing to be a priest. And you prayed for me behind the, the curtains, behind the stage, before I went off the next morning and became a priest. And the third spiritual father was Mario Jorge Bergoglio. Because you see, my wife, when she saw she could be Catholic and charismatic and evangelical and Pentecostal, and it was absolutely accepted within the Catholic Church, she said that she'd like to reconnect her roots with her Catholic culture. So she did. And so I was working in Italy with the Catholic Church. My wife was a charismatic Catholic. My children were going to Catholic school, so we raised our kids Catholic. Charismatics, Pentecostals, Evangelicals. <laughs> Jesus was all of those, you know. 
Jesus is sacramental. He instituted the sacraments. He did the, the things that was required of him in the, in the synagogue. He believed in sign and symbol. He used it all the time in his parables. But he was also evangelical because he said, you have to be born again. It is written. He was also the contemplative. He was also the charismatic. How much of Jesus do you want? Do you only want one denomination of Jesus? Jump in, get it all. <laughs> so, uh, Padre Mario, Father Mario, he took me aside when he heard about my testimony about having this ecumenical family, and he started a friendship with me. We started studying together, meeting more often, to a point where he became one of my mentors. And it was very surprising to me when he emailed me a week before the, the election of the Pope last year, and he said, Tony, will you please pray for me because they called me into the conclave. Now, conclave is when they choose the Pope because conclave means with a key, with key, conchiave. That's what it means, with a key. They literally lock the cardinals into the Sistine Chapel until they've made a decision. Conclave. So I was thinking maybe he had to go in there and be one of the cardinals because he was a cardinal to pray for the Pope. And I was on the train leaving Rome that day when they announced the Pope. And the Pope was Mario Jorge Bergoglio. My friend, my spiritual father had become the Pope. Hmm. Now, you need to be clear, this is not about my story, even though I promised uh, Kenneth asked me if I'd just connect the dots so you'd understand. This is important for you. It's important for the partners because you support the work I do. But this is not about my story. This is about his story. His story. Because God is doing something. Now, I walked in after, uh, well, I, I'm jumping the gun. Let me just say this. Uh, Christmas time. Because my spiritual father, one of my mentors, had become Pope, I'm, I'm mature enough to know that my relationship is going to change now. I, I, I mean, he's got a new job description. I didn't expect to have a friendship like I had before. But I felt blessed that I had that time with him. He imparted many things to me, like all my spiritual fathers have. I got a phone call just after Christmas when I was relaxing with my son, watching a bit of TV. And uh, I grabbed my, my mobile phone. I said, yes, uh, Tony Palmer speaking. And he says, hello, this is Pope Francis. <laughs> I thought it was one of my friends. <laughs> yeah. They were looking at me through the window. And I said, Father Mario? He said, yes. So I ran upstairs to my office where there was no noise. And I said, um, <clears throat> what are you phoning me for? He said, when are you going to be in Rome next? I said, I'll be in Rome next two weeks' time. I have to visit one of my congregations. He said, can you come and see me? <laughs> yeah, this nobody from South Africa who gives up his house to follow some crazy call from the Catholics ends up getting a phone call at home from the Pope. So I said to him, look, I'll be there on the 13th. He said, no, I'm busy. And this is, I'm not making this up. This is how it was. Emmy was at the door listening to the conversation. And uh, I said, well, I can do the 14th. I can stay one day extra in Rome. He said, let me go get my diary. I heard the phone go on the table. I heard the feet <laughs> come back. He said, Bishop Tony? He said, yes. He said, 14th's good for me. I'm free. He said to me, what time? I said, huh, you're the Pope, and you're asking me what time? <laughs> He said, yeah, what time suits you? So I thought, well, 10 o'clock, because I can miss the traffic, because Rome's bad, the traffic. So I said, uh, 10 o'clock will suit me fine. He said, see you at 10 o'clock. So I said to him, I said, uh, Pope Francis, I can't believe that you're phoning me. I don't know how to react to you. I was just being honest. He said, what do you mean? I said, you're the Pope of the Universal Church. <laughs> 1.2 billion people. And I'm just an, uh, an everyday clergyman doing his bit for the kingdom. 
He said, Tony, we cut covenant. We are brothers. He said, nothing will change that friendship. I was blessed. Because all these stories you've heard about Francis, about picking his friends up in his Pope-mobile and taking them, and all that, going out to visit people, this, he hasn't changed his spots. So, I went last Tuesday, I went to see him. We had the morning together, just me and him, the whole morning in his apartment. And uh, I asked him, I said, uh, so what's the agenda? Why did you call me? He said, I have no agenda. There's nothing to discuss. That's a father. That's a mentor. So I started to tell him, you know, I said, I can't believe I'm sitting here. I said, you know how much we can do together? Yes. And we made a covenant to work for unity for the church. And I said, listen, next week, I'm going to Kenneth Copeland Ministries Ministers Conference. And I told him about you. I told him all your crazy stories. <laughs> I said, there's going to be thousands of leaders, and these guys have their jets. They've got TV shows. And I said, they've got churches of 10,000, 2,000, 20,000. I said, these are big fishes. <laughs> so he said, so what do you want to do? I said, well, can you please? I told him that, about Kenneth and Gloria's partnership with us from day one. And uh, you know, a lot, I lost a lot of evangelical friends because they thought I'd betrayed the faith because I was building a kingdom and not an empire. Sorry. <laughs> and so... I said to him, how's about we take, can you give Kenneth a word and give the leaders a word? He said, okay. So I'm waiting for him. And he says, uh, you want to take a message next week to Texas for me? I said, yes, sir. So I said, do you want me to write it down? He said, why don't we make a video? <laughs> now, I had in the back of my mind, I had my iPhone, all right? I always have my iPhone. I had in the back of my mind to ask him, but I didn't want to be cheeky and break the friendship. I don't want to, I don't want to abuse a friendship. Friendships are, are sacred. They are gifts from God. You can't use friendships. Let God use your friendship, but you don't use it. And so I was waiting for, to see if there was like a, a Holy Spirit opportunity to ask him. But he was the one who asked. He asked, can I make a video? And so we've had it edited. We've had it subtitled because he speaks in Italian. We, he doesn't speak English. He tries in the beginning, but then he switches to Italian straight away. So tonight, the Pope, it's a historic moment because I've never, I've served three Popes because I started working with them when John Paul was still alive and then Pope Benedict and now Pope Francis. And you know, Pope Francis, St. Francis of Assisi was an open charismatic. This is the first Pope in history that's took the Francis's name, because he's openly charismatic. And this is history that we've got a Pope who recognizes us as brothers and sisters, speaks to us as brothers and sisters, and has sent a message to us, and you'll see what the message is about. And I need you to at least understand a little bit of the, the history behind this, because we are living in an incredibly important generation. I believe that God has brought me here to this year's Ministers' Conference in the spirit of Elijah. Let me explain. If you look carefully, the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers. And to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons. To prepare the way for the Lord. And we know that prophecy always has a double fulfillment. And we know that Elijah will come before the second coming as well. And I've understood that the spirit of Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation. To return hearts to each other. This is very important. We know that the first thousand years there was one church. It was called the Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal. It doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means, you, if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. <laughs> Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther and his protest. Three churches in 1,500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. And then from 
Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic. It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course, it's true. The glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. Therefore, Christian unity is the basis of our credibility because Jesus said until they won, they will not believe. The world will not believe, as they should, until we are one. Division destroys our credibility. It is fear that keeps us separated because fear is false evidence appearing real. It's an acronym. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Because most of your fear is based on propaganda. Now, why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together. Because in the Protestant church, we had a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again, but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue. Because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together, we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement, but as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. <laughs> but we are reformed. We're Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. We now preach you are saved by grace through faith alone. The word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. The protest is over.
So let me pray, and then we'll start the video. I believe we will begin to see more and more people called out to go into the world and work among the churches in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Ministries of reconciliation. We need to throw as much resources and energy into the ministry of reconciliation as we do to the ministry of evangelization. Yeah. Or are we building walls without foundations? I challenge you to find a bridge builder and back him or her. And I'd like to pray this prayer. And if you agree, you can say amen. This was a dying man's prayer. And when you know you're about to die, you certainly pray the most important prayers. He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one as we are one. Glory to the Father. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, excuse me, because I speak in Italian, but I I'm not uh, speaking English, but uh, I will speak uh, no Italian, no English, but carefully. È una lingua più semplice e più autentica. E questa lingua del cuore ha un linguaggio e una grammatica speciale, la grammatica semplice, due regole, ama Dio soprattutto e ama l'altro perché il tuo fratello e la tua sorella e con queste due cose andiamo avanti. Io sono qui con mio fratello mio vescovo fratello Tony Palmer, siamo amici da anni e lui mi ha detto che del vostro compegno, del vostro raduno, e con piacere vi invio un saluto, un saluto gioioso e nostalgico. Gioioso perché eh, a me da gioia che, che voi siete riuniti per lodare Gesù Cristo, l'unico Signore, eh, per eh, pregare al Padre e ricevere lo Spirito. Eh, questo dà gioia perché si vede che il Signore lavora in tutto il mondo. È nostalgico perché... Ma succede come nei quartieri fra noi, no? nei quartieri ci sono famiglie che si vogliono e famiglie che non si vogliono, famiglie che si uniscono e famiglie che si separano e noi siamo un po', mi permetto la parola, separati, separati perché i peccati ci hanno separati, i nostri peccati, e i malintesi nella storia, ma una lunga strada di peccato comunitario, ma chi ha la colpa? Tutti abbiamo la colpa, tutti siamo peccatori, eh? soltanto uno è il giusto, il Signore. E io ho la nostalgia 
che questa separazione finisca e ci dia la comunione, la nostalgia di quell'abbraccio di qua, nel, nel quale parla la Sacra Scrittura, quando i fratelli di Giuseppe affamati sono andati a Egitto per comprare, per poter mangiare. Ma andavano a comprare, avevano i soldi, ma non potevano mangiare i soldi. E lì hanno trovato qualcosa più del pasto, hanno trovato il fratello. Tutti noi abbiamo dei soldi, i soldi della cultura, i soldi della nostra storia, di tante ricchezze culturali, anche religiose, tra, tradizioni diverse. ma dobbiamo trovarci come fratelli e dobbiamo piangere insieme come ha fatto Giuseppe quel pianto che unisce il pianto dell'amore io vi parlo come fratello eh? e vi parlo così semplicemente con gioia e nostalgia facciamo crescere la nostalgia perché questo ci spingerà a trovarci a abbracciarci e a lodare Gesù Cristo come unico Signore della storia vi ringrazio tanto per sentirmi vi ringrazio tanto per lasciarmi parlare la lingua del cuore e vi chiedo anche un favore di pregare per me perché ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere io prego per voi, eh? lo farò ma io ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere e pregare al Signore perché ci unisca tutti e avanti, siamo fratelli, ci diamo spiritualmente questo abbraccio e lasciamo che il Signore finisca l'opera che Lui ha incominciato. Perché questo è un miracolo, il miracolo dell'unità è, è incominciato. E dice uno scrittore italiano, il Manzoni, famoso, dice questa frase in un romanzo, un uomo, un uomo semplice del popolo dice questa frase Non ho trovato mai che il Signore abbia incominciato un miracolo senza finirlo bene. Lui finirà bene questo miracolo dell'unità. Vi chiedo di benedirmi e io vi benedico. Di fratello a fratello. Un abbraccio. Grazie. Oh. Glory, glory, glory. Tony, thank you, sir. Come on, the man asked us to pray for him. Oh, Father. Father, we, we answer his request. And since we know not how to pray for him as we ought other than to agree with him in his quest and in, in his, his, his heart for the unity of the body of Christ, we come together in the unity of our faith. Hallelujah. So, Father, we just, all of us now, according to Scripture, when we know not how to pray as we ought, we pray for him in the Spirit. 
We receive utterance in the Holy Ghost. We receive prayers of faith. We receive, sir, we receive words that are not our own. La del gruppo mo meno in tele aschepe. Ve folo po ma mamma e tel clemino kido. Co polo mai a tale endole come meste stelo clo fra il plebo le camana. Bramande che di co po ma bles do boschire tele cheto le campagna nena ma clo ma hala larghero che le veno. Bretto stesche manetelo. Cherebana, cherebana. Palo come un po le che to le stindo do le cava. <laughs> oh, hallelujah, 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 glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Father, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Tony, bring your phone in. Come here. <clears throat> I want you to video a message back. Come up here and let's do it this way so he can see this, this whole congregation. So I've got to go to the Vatican again. Yes. <laughs> my dear sir. My dear sir. Thank you so from the bottom of our hearts. All of these leaders represent literally tens of thousands of people that love you, that believe God with you, and in answer to your request, we have just prayed for you and with you, and we did so in the Spirit. And we believe we receive, according to the words of Jesus in Mark eleven twenty four. Whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Our desire, sir, along with you, is in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Thank you, sir. We do bless you. We receive your blessing. It's very, very important to us. And we bless you with all of our hearts. We bless you with all of our souls. We bless you with all of our might. And we thank you, sir. We thank God for you. And so, all of us declare together, be blessed. Once again, all together, be blessed. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> I think you're going to have to come to the Vatican. I will.
I'm available. Praise God. God's will be done. Amen. Tony, thank you, sir. My, how you blessed this place tonight. I love you. I love you. Give him a love, Dan. Thank you. Amen. Woo! I told you you'd never forget it. Ha, 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 